Hello, and welcome to Test Tube Talks. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science related with the best minds in the field. I'm Sanjam Sangari, and this episode's topic will be the groundbreaking Mosaic Arctic Expedition that recently came to a close. With me today, I have Dr. Matthew Shoup. Dr. Shoup, a member of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, was one of the leading scientists of Mosaic, which stands for the Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. This expedition was the largest Arctic expedition in history and a huge success, lasting from summer 2019 to summer 2020 and returning with a treasure trove of research data. Now I present Dr. Matthew Shoup. Hello, Dr. Shoup. Uh, welcome. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. So before we begin, I think it would just be important for the audience to get to know the basics of the Mosaic exp- expedition a little bit. So what was essentially the purpose of Mosaic and how was the expedition carried out through its timeline? Yeah, so Mosaic is all about the changing Arctic. So the Arctic sea ice is declining, and this has a lot of implications for the rest of our globe and our ecosystem. And so we're very interested in understanding the processes of change there in the middle of the sea ice. And so we want to go out to the Arctic sea ice and make observations that cut across the whole system, that look at the atmosphere, the ice, and the ocean together, and the processes related to how the ice is declining and how that affects the rest of the system. And so our design, the basic concept was to take a ship, and in our case, this was the German research vessel Polar Stern. It's an icebreaker. We took it out into the Arctic sea ice and froze it in for a whole year to drift with the sea ice. Uh, And then we also set up a bunch of equipment out on the ice around the ship. And over the course of that year, we made all kinds of measurements of the system embedded right in the middle of it um, so that we could really understand those changes happening. And we've just come to an end to that project. We just came back from the field and now have a ton of data to actually go after the questions that we have, which, like I said, were related to the changing sea ice uh, and our, our general, you know, building an understanding of the changing Arctic system so that we can represent it in models that help us to forecast the weather or predict climate or assess the ecosystem, things like that. Right. So when you went on the polar stern, like the, the ship that you used, uh, the icebreaker, So did you have everything, just all the equipment on that ship, and then you used everything from there? Or was there like a separate process that you used? We did take most of the equipment with us on that ship. There actually was another ship that went with us initially to help install a lot of equipment, and then that ship went back home. But most of the equipment was on Polar Stern. There was a lot of equipment installed on the decks. There was a lot of equipment that um, we put out on the ice around the decks. And... Um, yeah, most of it was just packed on board. We had labs on board. We had balloons that we launched. We had aircraft that we flew, like unmanned aircraft, drones, and things like that. All kinds of equipment um, all around this whole kind of facility. We had a thing called the Central Observatory, which is right near the ship. And then we had a distributed network, which was up to 50 kilometers away from the ship with all these buoys and you know other kinds of um, nets to catch, catch your little uh, biological critters in the ocean. And Um, We would send things down in the ocean and back up. And so it's just all over, like every different direction you could imagine. We're making samples and making measurements. Wow. So this looks like, so this project seems like it was pretty much equipped to measure anything in the Arctic. So which were some of the research areas that you focused on during Mosaic's year in the Arctic? Yeah, there's a lot of research areas. Um, So in kind of general terms, we looked at the atmosphere, the sea ice, and the ocean. And we looked at those from the physical, the biological, and the chemical perspectives, right? So you can imagine there's lots of different disciplines there. So we had people that are looking at the ecosystem, looking at gases, biogeochemistry, people that are looking at um, sea ice physics, people that are looking at what's happening in the atmosphere with clouds, with radiation. So there's so many different um, topics that we studied. And that was kind of the point of Mosaic was to study these all together so that we could understand how they were related to each other. So I'm a cloud scientist. I study cloud formation, cloud processes, how the clouds affect radiation, and how that affects the surface, right? The surface energy budget, the amount of energy that the sea ice experiences. And so I'm there, but then there's other people that are studying, say, hey, the biology in the ocean. And the biology in the ocean really cares about how much sunlight comes into the ocean. And my clouds actually are 
really important in determining the amount of sunlight. And so you can imagine there might be some connections there. And that's one example of the many different kinds of connections that we really wanted to, to, to examine and, and foster out there in the field. Wow. Yeah, so you talked about how a little bit more of your specialty was clouds and radiation. So could you maybe explain a little bit more of that? Yeah, clouds are, well, they're really important for the global system, right? Clouds play a few different roles for us. One is they, of course, bring precipitation. That's a really important thing uh, in the Arctic. Snowfall um, lands on the sea ice and it has all kinds of different roles that it plays there. Also, clouds are really important in the radiative balance of the Earth. So they play two roles uh, in radiation. One is that they reflect the sunlight. We all experience that. Clouds can be a shade for us. So that's really important because it reflects some amount of the sun's energy back to space. Another role that clouds play is as a blanket, right? They're kind of like a greenhouse. They trap the Earth's emitted radiation and emit it back to the Earth. And so that's a warming effect. So there's this cooling effect and this warming effect that are kind of balanced. And the Arctic's a really interesting place because in the wintertime, there is no sun, right? The sun never comes up. So it's dark for like four months in a row. And in the summertime, it's the opposite. The sun is constantly just circling the sky. And so you can imagine the role that clouds play is also changing over the course of the seasons. And so this is one of the important things that we wanted to look at is, you know, how do these seasonal changes in the sun angles interact with the clouds and how does that affect the total amount of energy that reaches the surface? So you can imagine in the wintertime, the blanketing effect of clouds is most important because there is no sun. So clouds warm the surface in the Arctic actually for most of the year. It's only in the middle of summer that they actually cool the surface a little bit. And this is counter to the rest of the globe. Globally, clouds cool the earth. That's the, one of the big roles of clouds. But in the Arctic, they actually warm the surface. So that's that's really fascinating and something that's important as we think about the role of clouds in the overall changing Arctic system. So what were the benefits of studying um, these kind of topics in the Arctic system rather than in a different part of the globe, like especially with clouds and radiation or with other topics? Yeah, clouds and radiation are studied all around the globe, right? This is one of the most important problems that we have, especially if we think about um, climate models, models that are, are put together to really understand our whole global system, um, clouds are a huge uncertainty. And so we need to study them everywhere. And there are many different projects to look at clouds uh, in a variety of different locations. So why the Arctic? Um, well, we have actually very few observations in the Arctic, right? Historically, uh, it's just hard to be there, especially in the Arctic winter. It's, it's very hard to be there. And so we don't have many observations. And you can imagine if you're building a model, right? A mo model is very sophisticated to try to represent our whole Earth's climate system and the role of clouds. And you can imagine that if you build that model and you're only using observations of clouds that are from, say, the United States or Asia or Europe or somewhere that's in the middle latitudes, that might not represent the actual processes that are happening in clouds in the Arctic. And so we actually need to go to the Arctic to understand the unique aspects of clouds there and so that we can better represent those in our models. Wow. Yeah. So, and as... And as you know, you're a co-coordinator in the Mosaic expedition, so you were a pretty important person there. Um, so obviously you had a huge role in the expedition. So specifically, what areas uh, besides uh, atmospheric physics and things like that, like what other areas did you oversee or like take part in mostly? Yeah, I played many, many roles in Mosaic. I, I've been working on this project for more than 12 years now from some of the initial Ideas all the way through now, you know, we've completed the field operations. So, yeah, a lot of roles uh, in the scientific design and kind of bringing people together, the international community together to, to really work on uh, the notion of Mosaic and what we did, would do, what the plans were, how we would implement these, these plans. Um, I was definitely very much involved in um, how do we handle the data? We have to come up with a data plan, right? The data is our legacy. And so I was very much involved with a team of people to figure out uh, a policy for how we handle the data and how we bring our international collaborators together under a, a unified vision there. Um, very much uh, in terms of the planning of people and coordinating of people, um, a lot had to be done in terms of 
putting together different teams of people and different investigators so that those teams would make sense. They would cover all the things that we needed to cover in the field. Um, over the course of the year, we would transition people in and out of the ship every couple of months. And so you can imagine that that's a lot of thinking that you have to do ahead of time to make sure that the people on site can do what needs to be done. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the last year has been dedicated to field operations and um, being on the ground, oh, in this case, on the ice, to really um, make sure that everything plays out how we want it to play out. And, and it's a challenge. Uh, there was lots of um, lots of challenges that came our way and we had to adapt our strategy. And so having some people like myself, and, and there were certainly others as well on the leadership team that had a bigger, like a higher level vision was really important, right? We know how the pieces fit together. There's all these different projects, all these different participants and how do they fit together? And then how do we adapt that to the evolving conditions? And so um, that was one of the roles that I played uh, was to help adapt that and to to solve problems and to ensure that all the individual investigators that are there could accomplish the science that they were there to accomplish so that ultimately it serves the, the greater benefit of Mosaic. Yeah. And I think you said it took 12 years uh, of research and like preparations before you started this project. So um, what were some of the like very first things that caused this project to like uh, go into light or like what was one of the first couple of things um, that started that caused you and your team to think, hey, let's start this expedition. Yeah, I will say that there were multiple paths that contributed to this, right? Multiple people came together with their parts of the vision. For me personally, um, I was on an icebreaker near the North Pole back in 2008 on a different ex expedition. Um, and that was a much shorter one. That one was only out there for about six weeks. And for me, you know, I was there, I was looking at the clouds, I was looking at radiation, you know, doing my kind of work. And, and there, there was the sea ice, of course, there and, and all the different parts of the system. And it seemed to me that we were leaving before we even understood what was happening, right? It was such a short expedition that I, I didn't have the context that I needed to understand how the clouds, how the atmosphere is interacting with the ice and leading to the, these transitions that we're seeing. So to me, it was just too short. We needed to be there longer. I, I needed to know what happened to the ice before you know, we got there and after we left. And, and so we, we really needed to extend the time much longer. And I had actually been on a year-long expedition to the Arctic oh, about more than 20 years ago. So I knew about the, the concept, of course. Um, and I, I've been to the Arctic many times and so started putting together some ideas like, oh, what would it take now in the new Arctic, in this Arctic with thinner ice to go there for a full year? What kind of science would we want to do? How would we design that? And so I started putting together some thoughts. And then over the course of a couple of years, you know, those plans started to take some good vision, talking to some people, connecting with some people, finding other people that had similar ideas uh, that they had generated, uh, and then starting to bring these ideas together and having some joint meetings internationally, bringing in a lot of collaborators so that we could, could start to build this vision, this, this joint vision of, hey, what what is the best thing to do in the middle of the Arctic so that we can understand that changing system and, and how what's our best approach? How do we implement that with the logistics like ships and other things like that? What are the important measurements to make? Who are the important people to be involved? All these kind of topics that we were talking about and ultimately developing a plan that then, well, we started to move towards implementing that plan. Yeah, and speaking of like people that you worked with on creating the plan, uh, a significant amount of people who worked on the Mosaic expedition were actually from the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany. Um, so what affiliation did you and other researchers have with uh, the people of that university? How did you guys uh, meet and start bringing this project to life together? Yeah, the Alfred Wegener Institute has played a really important role in Mosaic. Um, so one of the initial you know, people that had ideas to go to the Arctic was a man named Klaus Detloff. And he and I, we met up with each other uh, in, I think it was late 2010 or early 2011. Um, and we realized that we ha both have these, um, these great ideas and we started to combine those ideas and move forward and build, bring other people to the table. Um, so one of the most important things though about the Alfred Wegener Institute is they have a lot of resources. And after a few years of building our vision, building a science plan, talking with the international community, getting a lot of excitement about this concept. At some point, 
the Alfred Wagner Institute said, okay, you can use the ship for a full year. And that was super important, right? The ship is the most expensive single resource out there. It's the hardest thing to, to, to bring to the table. Um, and so when they said, you know, we can use Polar Stern, that, that is what really made Mosaic come to reality um, because it was the biggest piece. And then at that point, it was more like, wow, everybody wants to get on board, right? All kinds of different countries want to participate uh, and engage and bring their scientists. So, so that centerpiece was really important. And then, of course, along with that centerpiece, um, the Alfred Wagner Institute um, is the chief institution for the, the whole mosaic, right? They, um, they brought the most resources. They had all kinds of funding from Germany to provide um, support for that ship, uh, for rotating uh, different people in and out, providing a lot of fantastic scientists. Uh, and so, yeah, the Alfred Wagner Institute as the lead institute um, provided a, a major contribution to Mosaic and um, were really the leaders all through. Yeah. And speaking of like contribution and um, like to the to your project, your team has said that um, Mosaic took inspiration from Fridjof Nansen, uh, one of the Norwegian Arctic explorers of the late 19th century. So what inspiration did your team take from uh, previous voyages or from like but even those as far back as his and like, how did his endeavors influence like this expedition? Yeah. Nansen is, you know, for people that do polar research like myself, Nansen is one of those iconic people, of course, right. He was an explorer and importantly, he was a scientist as well. Right. So he made some of the, the earliest measurements in the central Arctic that are still super relevant today. Right. These, these are a benchmark for us uh, to make the comparisons with, Hey, you know, we drifted way faster than NASA did, or, hey, the ice is way thinner, right? So, so that was an early benchmark. Um, another really important thing about Nansen is that he demonstrated something that's called the transpolar drift of the sea ice. There's some circulation patterns of the ice, the kind of ways that it, it moves across the Arctic. And there's one that kind of goes across from Siberia over towards the Fram Strait. And he demonstrated that, right? He, he kind of speculated that it was there. And then his voyage with the Fram actually showed that it, in fact, happened that way. And that's the exact path that we took with Mosaic. So we're really following in Nansen's footsteps there. But also for Mosaic, there was a, a number of other projects that were really important. Um, for many, many years, uh, Russia has had a Russian drifting station program where they would put um, scientists out on the ice to drift for a year or more um, to, to do a lot of scientific studies. Also, I, I mentioned you know, 22 years ago, I was part of the Sheba expedition. This was another project where we froze an icebreaker into the Arctic sea ice for a year. This was more in the Alaska, Canada sector uh, of the Arctic. But that actually, for myself personally, was really foundational in designing Mosaic, right? It was very much based on that and building off of that, um, where, you know, my input into Mosaic, that's where that came. Uh, and then there's been a number of other shorter term activities over the, the last couple of decades some of which I've been involved in, some of which I was not involved in, where ships would go in for relatively, you know, shorter time periods, um, but would make really important measurements that helped us to kind of get some insight into what's important to measure there. And so all these pieces kind of came together so that we could design this kind of grand design of what Mosaic is. And, and, and in the end, we came up with, you know, I'll just have to say it's the greatest expedition ever to the Arctic, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's the most sophisticated, most comprehensive, most complex scientifically um, expedition that's that's ever been to the Central Arctic. Yeah. So while we're comparing Mosaic to like these other expeditions, uh, what important aspects would you say set Mosaic away from like these other previous expeditions that have happened in the past? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and it's a question that, um, of course, a lot of people ask. Um, you know, why do we need to spend all this money to go out there again? You've already been there, right? That's, that's a great question. Um, but there are some really important ways in which Mosaic is quite distinct from these past um, expeditions. Um, Sheba, which is, you know, where I started, uh, is probably the, the closest analog to Mosaic. It's a ship that's out there for the full year, not that long ago, you know, a couple decades ago. Um, Sheba was still, though, by being two decades ago, was still in a different Arctic. The Arctic has changed so much in the last two decades. We couldn't even do Shiva anymore because in the summertime, that's open ocean. That's not even ice anymore. 
So the ice has changed a lot. And so that's one important thing about mosaic is it's in the current Arctic, right? We need to understand the Arctic now. We don't need to understand it. Well, we still do need to understand it from the past, but we really do also need to understand it now, right? That's a really important thing is what's different about this thin ice that we have in the Arctic now. Another important thing is the interdisciplinary aspect of mosaic. There are not that many projects that really do this kind of very comprehensive interdisciplinary look at the Arctic system. Often it's a group of atmospheric scientists like myself that go there, or maybe a group of biologists that go there, and they go do fantastic work in their different areas. But the cool thing about Mosaic is we've really brought together so many different disciplines at one place to make all these measurements together so that we can understand and kind of build synthesis across all these different disciplines. So that's another really cool thing. And then a third one is the instrumentation. Right? We are in this era of just explosion of our technology. And so the, the things that we had in the past, a couple decades ago, even one decade ago, um, many of them are great observations. Many of them are things we still do today. But a lot of what we have today is we're continuing to break new ground in our ability um, to bring technology to the table that can give us insight into important aspects. And so some of the things like for myself, right, for the first time at Mosaic, for the first time ever, we had a scanning cloud radar operated in the Arctic sea ice. This is a cloud radar, not too different from what you see on the, the, weather, the weather channel, but it's tuned up to look at clouds and it scans around to give you volumes of clouds. I mean, this is really eye-opening if you want to understand details of cloud processes, cloud formation, and, and so many other uh, properties. So... That's one example. There are many others where Mosaic was the first of its kind for some cutting edge new measurement. Um, and that's providing this level of uh, information and insight into the processes. And that's the key word, the processes that are happening there uh, that we're try trying to understand. So that was another reason why Mosaic's distinct from the past. So in your opinion, how would you describe um, Mosaic's success so far? Like, what were the most important things that your team that you believe that your team accomplished uh, during your year in the Arctic? Yeah, success. Um, success is an evolving concept, right? I mean, in the end, in the very long run, success is measured by what we accomplish, and the accomplishments come through analysis and synthesis of the data, and that will take a long time, right? So we we haven't gotten there yet. But I would say we had these intermediate successes, right? We lasted a whole year in the Arctic. That's awesome, right? That, that was one of our major benchmarks, and we actually did that. We made observations through a really challenging set of conditions. The ice was very breakable. Uh, we had to reinstall our camps multiple times, move things around, rescue equipment. So that whole concept was very challenging. Of course, uh, coronavirus, who would have thought we could have, you know, worked our way through that whole process? But somehow, amazingly, we were able to keep things moving forward, even though it really complicated the scene, right? It really complicated our ability to rotate people and supplies, um, and it did have some effect on our science. But in spite of that, we still you know, persisted through. So we've collected a data set that is unparalleled. It's unprecedented. And so that, to me, I mean, there's no way to characterize it other than hugely successful. Now, it's not exactly the data set that we had envisioned. Right? We, we had these plans ahead of time, and it's not exactly that um, because it had to adapt to the conditions that the Arctic threw at us. But it's still this really fantastic data set that is going to show us so much. It's going to provide so much insight into um, the key processes that are happening in the Central Arctic. So uh, that, that's a huge success in my eyes. Yeah, and speaking of COVID-19, so you and your team with Mosaic were uh, still like doing your experiment like before the pandemic and uh, when it first came into light and all of that. So what kind of things did you guys uh, or did your team have to do to sort of like adjust to it or uh, make changes to your experiment? Yeah, that's that's a great question as well. COVID-19 challenged international travel, of course, right? That That's a, a big um, result of the pandemic. And so we had plans for uh, in the springtime for an aircraft campaign that would fly airplanes out of Svalbard, which is kind of an island north of Norway, fly aircraft around uh, the ship to provide some really great science measurements. And we had to cancel that, unfortunately, because we could not get people uh, and, and 
resources there to do that campaign. So that was, you know, one of the, um, yeah, things that we lost due to the COVID-19 situation. Also, as the springtime evolved, right, as the, as the whole globe started to tackle this problem and not, not you know, they, they weren't really sure where things were going. There was all kinds of closures. There's travel restrictions, quarantines, all this kind of stuff. It, it became really complicated. And, and some of the vessels that we had planned to take people out there and rotate our crew could no longer do that role. And so what we actually had is our leg three, the third leg that we had there, those people were in, in a way kind of trapped out there for a while because we had no way to get to them. Um, we couldn't get the ships arranged. And so those people actually stayed out there for about two months longer than they planned um, be, until we could finally get together uh, a kind of a new approach to doing the logistics. Um, and I was actually involved in the new approach as it came out to rotate those people. And that involved um, changing our plans altogether. People had to go to Germany, which we were fortunately able to get into Germany with some special uh, arrangements with the health authorities. We did a, a very rigged, a rugged um, quarantine process there where it's, we were totally isolated for quite some time. We had multiple tests. And so it was, we definitely wanted to make sure that we had no chance of getting any kind of virus out of the ship. So after this very extensive um, multi-week quarantine period, we then boarded some ships that then went out there and we were able to meet the Polar Stern and rotate our people and go back out. And fortunately, that, that was a successful process. And that was really the key right there. Getting past that rotation was the key. Uh, and then after that, things have kind of gone smoothly since then. Um, but of course, we put a lot of effort into making sure that we did not get any of the virus out there. And so it actually was pretty interesting. So I was there on leg four and we all went through that process of, you know, ensuring that we didn't have virus. So when we were there, we actually didn't have to socially distance. We didn't have to worry about the virus because we knew that everybody there did not have the virus. And so it was actually kind of relieving to be there without no masks, no social distancing. We could just live a normal life. So that was kind of refreshing, um, even though the, the the whole pandemic was raging across the rest of the globe. Yeah, so obviously COVID-19 was a huge setback um, for your team at Mosaic. And it's really interesting how you guys were so efficiently able to sort of like, you know, move away from all of that and force social distancing, all of that um, in a proper way. Um, so what other kind of, uh, major setbacks did your team uh, have to in, sort, of, sort of encounter uh, throughout the year? And like, how did you guys overcome these? Yeah, there were many, many uh, challenges. That's kind of one of the main themes of Mosaic is uh, challenges and overcoming those challenges. So right from the beginning, we went out into the ice and we had to find a an ice flow to park, you know, to moor our ship next to and to set up our equipment on. And right away, the ice was thinner than we hoped, right? We were looking for a meter thick ice and we found maybe 70 centimeters at the most. So the ice was already thinner than we wanted. We were a little nervous about that just from the very beginning. And then in the first leg, I, I was also there in the first leg. This is as we're, as the sun is going down, as we're starting to transition into winter, the ice is already starting to break up all through our camp. It makes us reinstall our equipment all over the place because this dynamic ice. Um, and so that was uh, also something, you know, we knew the ice was dynamic, but it seemed more dynamic than we had planned. So that was a huge challenge, of course. Um, and then another one is that we had done tons of planning, looking at the drift of the ice over many years so that we could figure out, hey, where do we want to install the ship? Right? What's the best place? We, we had a number of objectives. We want to stay in the ice for a year. We don't want to get drifted out to the ice edge. We don't want to drift into anybody's exclusive economic zone like Russia's zone, which is where we near where we started. Um, a number of things like that. And so we had all this planning in place about how fast things would drift based on the last 12 years of observations. And then this year happened where a large scale circulation pattern set up that just blew our ship and our whole installation across the Arctic, across the transpolar drift of the ice, much faster than planned, much faster. And so we actually ended up getting all the way to the ice edge 
by the end of our leg four. So we had to reposition the ship, you know, back to the north. So that's another huge challenge. We didn't plan on that. We we were very much planning on not doing that. That, but this year the Arctic set up the way that it did, and it pushed us across the Arctic faster than we planned. And so that was another challenge. But again, we rolled with all those challenges, and I think those were, in the end, they were all really opportunities for us to understand this Arctic system as it's kind of revealing itself to us. Right, we're right in the middle of all this change, all this dynamics all this kind of interesting evolution of the system. Yeah, obviously for any science experiment, um, one of the most important things that you could do is know how to adapt to your situation. And it's so interesting to see that you and your team were able to do that so efficiently. Um, and obviously, um, one of the most important aspects of, your, um, of the studying of this environment is probably climate change and global warming. So... Obviously, we've seen uh, a decrease in like the ice shelves and there's a lot of melting going on in like the Arctic and the Antarctic. So what do you think that the results that you've gotten from this experiment can bring to spread more awareness about climate change and global warming? There's two sides of this, right? There's one side, which is the information gathering side. And I think we've gathered a lot of information to understand climate change. We have to observe it. That's an important part. But we really have to model it, right? We don't know what's going to happen in 100 years, but our models hopefully can tell us that, right? And, and those models require having very robust process level understanding that's embedded in all this programming and all this code that models our Earth system, right? So for us to say, hey, what's going to happen if we continue emitting a certain amount of greenhouse gases? What's going to happen in 100 years? We have to have a model that can tell us that. And that model needs these, these processes. So that's a really important part of how Mosaic can contribute to our understanding of this evolving global and especially Arctic system. There's another part of that equation, though. Um, and you, you said something to the effect of kind of bringing awareness. And, and that's an important part as well, right? So, you know, scientists will, will do our work. We'll design our ex experiments uh, and we'll carry on that way. But it's also important that we communicate with the, the kind of broader community, right? The stakeholders, people in society, right? They need to understand what's happening in, in the Arctic. They need to understand what scientists are doing and why we're doing that. And so Mosaic actually has been a tremendous opportunity to do that, right? It's, in, in a sim simply put, it's, it's photogenic, right? Mo Mosaic is super exciting. I mean, there's polar bears there, there's ice dynamics, there's so many interesting optics that there's scientists in the field doing all these kind of crazy things. What's that instrument? And all, you know, so there's so many things that are really exciting to people. And we've had a lot of interaction with um, a number of different stakeholders um, from education, so K to 12 education, colleges, the general public, the media, all kinds of different outreach and interaction to help bring this message that we've um, been developing from the Central Arctic to a much bigger audience, to, to really help them to see the value uh, in both the science and also to understand, hey, this change is happening right now, and how does that affect me back home? So I, I think that that's been a really successful aspect of Mosaic as well. Yeah, and so you talked a lot about uh, your modeling um, techniques and technology that you're using with Mosaic. So how are you using these modeling, um, I assume you use software or, or things like that. So how are you using these um, technologies to predict what's happening or what might happen in the future, like with climate change or melting? Or... Yeah, there are many different types of models, many different. And, and some of them, so I, I think of my own area, cloud research, right? We can observe certain details about the clouds, certain properties of the clouds. But there's other things that we cannot observe, right? We just, it's, it's not really possible for us to observe yet, but they're still really important processes. And so what we've done is build what are called cloud models, basically. They, they look in very fine detail at what is happening in a cloud. And you can imagine that if you can get a model to represent the processes that we observe pretty well, and it does a good job of representing those, well, then maybe it actually also represents those processes that we can't observe. And so you can have this synergy between a model and observations to actually learn more about what's happening 
at a process level in the clouds. And so that's one kind of very detailed focused uh, type of model. You can bump up to more kind of larger scale models, right? So weather forecasting models, we all are interested in the weather. What's gonna happen tomorrow? What's gonna happen next week? Those are models, right? That the National Weather Service and, and you know other groups are doing forecasts of our weather based on models. And those models will do things like, hey, how much moisture is coming and how will that condense and what's the temperature and how much precipitation will that, and all these processes are all part of what a model is telling us. And we have experts that can look at the results of the model and interpret that and then provide us with a weather forecast. And then there's also climate models. Climate models are, well, they're global. They wanna take the whole global system. Many of them are coupled, which means that they couple the atmosphere, the ice, the ocean, the land, all the different pieces of the earth system together, right? And these are all talking to each other with different fluxes of energy or other aspects, moisture moving around. And so the models keeping track of all that, you know, super sophisticated. And those tools are the, the tools that we use to predict the future, right? What's going to happen in 100 years? Uh, and a climate model will tell us that. And, and this is where um, groups like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, this is IPCC, right? They, every couple of years, there's a big report about what's going to happen to our climate. And this is based on all the best climate models from all around the world. Right? Each nation has one or more climate models, and we bring them all together. This is the representation of the, our best understanding of the Earth system with the, the best physics we can put in there, the best chemistry and biology and all these different pieces that we put into these models. And what do they tell us? Right, And then we kind of synthesize that knowledge to give us an idea about where the Earth system is going. And um, So these are some of the different kinds of models, and there's many other ones uh, throughout there that help us to understand different parts of the problem at different scales, both spatially and temporally. So, so what, do you, what do you, in your opinion, in your what opinion, is the most, is the most successful, successful research? Uh, sorry, I can oh, hear a little sorry. bit of an echo of myself on your, okay. So in your opinion, what was the most successful research field that was studied in this expedition? And what do you believe we can surmise from this field? Wow. Um, there is so much that has been successful about Mosaic so far and, and will be. Um, and we don't even know the half of it yet, right? I mean, there, there's so much research to be done to really determine the success. I can speak very much to my own area of research, and that is looking at the atmosphere, looking at clouds and all the different variability in the atmosphere and how that affects the surface, the sea ice, from an energetic standpoint, right? So we've quantified all the different energy transfer terms. That's radiation, like from the sun. That's the turbulent mixing of the atmosphere, like winds mixing the temperature down. Um, that's phase transitions. That's conduction of heat through the sea ice between the ocean and the atmosphere. All these different terms, we've quantified them um, continuously under a, a variety of conditions over the whole year. And to me, if you want to understand what's happening to the sea ice, if you want to understand why is the ice thinner, why is it melting faster now, you have to understand that thermodynamic transfer of energy through the system, right? You have to understand that. Um, and so we've done a fantastic job of that. We've captured the whole year of that. And we understand now, or at least we have the data to understand, a lot of the drivers of the variability in those kind of processes. Because these are the kind of processes that are changing now, right? As the Arctic is transitioning, these are the processes that are shifting and we have to understand all the details. So, hey, if a little more sunlight comes in because there's a little less clouds, or if some other parameter changes, how does that affect this, you know, this mixing term over here? Or how does it affect how much energy is transferred from the bottom of the ice to the top of the ice? And how does that affect how much the ice grows in winter? Right? This is one of the kinds of thought processes that, that might be really important. And so we've got this awesome data set to really pick that apart in great detail and to really understand those processes. Yeah, so speaking of these data sets that you have, obviously in the year that you've been in the Arctic, Mosaic has probably gotten now like treasure troves of like all this research, all this data, all these measurements. So what are you planning on doing or what is this team planning on doing um, with all of these measurements? And like, I understand that you're probably going to like spend a lot of time analyzing it, but how is this going to work like with this data? Yeah, 
the data is the legacy, right? That the data is mosaic. And so now we have the data, but what do we do with that? And and yeah, there's many things that will play out. So some of the data we're still actually creating, right? Because we've made all these samples, right? We sampled the, you know, in little vials or in different containers. We sampled ocean water, we've sampled the sea ice, we've sampled the air, we've sampled the snow. And so many of those things are taken back to the labs and that's where they do the analysis. So we're still making measurements of those samples. So that, that part happens. Then there's pe other people that have the data already. Maybe they have their thermometer and they measure temperature for the whole year or you know whatever parameter. Now they take that data back and they will study it. And I would say initially what happens is a lot of us individuals, right? Individual investigators will take our data that we're responsible for and we'll look at it and we'll do some of the analyses that we had in mind. But that's kind of, you know, narrow and focused on our own objectives. But then slowly over time, after we are familiar with what's in our data, we've looked at the quality of our data to make sure that it's really robust. We've kind of filtered out bad data that we know, hey, we were sampling something that was, you know, contaminated or whatever. We've really worked with our own data and gotten it to a point where we feel like this is robust. This is really good data. I understand it. I've done some of my own analyses now. Hey, what's my colleague over there doing, right? I know that they've got some data that's actually really related to mine. And so, hey, let's have some conversations. Let's see what, what your data is looking like and what mine's looking like and how they actually say something bigger. And so we'll, over time, start to transition to more of that kind of research. That's really this collaborative space where we can kind of build a bigger picture and do some of the cross-cutting interactions. And then there's also, importantly, this interaction between observations and models. Right. So I'm an observational scientist mostly. So, you know, I could do observational research for my whole career, but it's less valuable unless it's actually taking the knowledge that we're gaining from that and helping to evaluate and improve our models. And so um, on my team, we have modelers. I have other modeler um, collaborators around the world that we work together with. So, so we say, hey, now from the observations, I've got this chunk of information. How do we use that information to say, uh, let's evaluate how good that model is. Let's see, does, does the model do a good job of representing this data? That's the first question. And generally the answer is mixed. You know, sometimes the models are good at certain things, but then we find that there are shortcomings. Of course, right? That's, the, that's part of the motivation why we keep doing this is because we know that there are shortcomings. And then we have to think about, okay, how do we take this information and actually improve the model? How do we do, develop the model further to put in more sophisticated details so that that model can then do a better job of representing what we need it to represent. And there's a variety of metrics for that. And so that's part of the process as well, um, so that we can continue to push this knowledge from the data through analysis and into models. Right. And I know you and your team have been on the Arctic for a year now. So that's like a huge amount of time. So you've also, like, while you have gathered like a wealth of data, you've also uh, probably gathered a wealth of experiences as well. So I just wanted to ask you personally, what was your personal, personal most memorable experience or most memorable highlight from your year at Mosaic? <laughs> you know, um, this is a, this is a really hard question because in large part, it's because there's so much that's memorable, right? You, you go to the Arctic and it's just fascinating. So it, it's almost like every day there's something that, that sticks with you that um, is just super fascinating. But if I had to boil it down, I, I would say um, there was a time in the middle of summer. So this is the, 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 the peak of the melt season. When, you know, we had an ice flow there that was approximately a circle about a kilometer across. And we had a lot of our research infrastructure set up on the ice. And there was this kind of middle part of the ice flow. It was really rugged because there was had been a lot of ridges that had formed. And now it started to get smoother rugged because it was melt season. And there, as the surface melts, as the snow melts, it starts to form melt ponds. And then as that continues to melt, those melt ponds start to connect with each other with these drainage channels. And eventually those drainage channels make it all the way to the edge of the ice flow. And a lot of that melt water drains off. And that's kind of part of the evolution of the system. And, you know, I went for a few walks out in the middle of our ice flow 
And it was just remarkable out there because it seemed like, it almost seemed like the desert to me. You know, I'm used to the deserts of Utah where, um, where you have this, this rock that's just carved by years of water and it's kind of rounded and it's got layers. And that's what it seemed like in the middle of our ice flow. It was this ice. Of course, the time scale is much shorter, but over the course of the melt season, it had kind of moved into this thing where there's this continuous network of these melt ponds and this meandering drainage channels that went on for hundreds and hundreds of meters. And it was, it was just this amazing landscape and, and the sun reflects off things in different ways. And so for me, it was one of the moments, and I'll tell you, I've had you know, probably 20 or 25 of these moments in my life, but in the Arctic where you're standing there and you're saying, wow, you know, this is just super tremendous. I like, I can't believe I get to stand here in the middle of this and experience this. Um, so that's one of, one of many, but I'll say even just from the mosaic year there, I had those kind of experiences, oh, I'd say at least 10 times. Uh, and then in my, in my past, you know, many times as well. So the Arctic never ceases to just amaze. Well, that sounds amazing. That sounds like an awesome experience for like everyone who worked with Mosaic. So just to conclude, I sort of wanted to ask for you, for your team, for uh, everyone at Mosaic, what comes next? What are you going to do after the experiment, after you come back from the Arctic? Yeah, for many of us, it'll be take a break, <laughs> have a little rest, right? It's been a lot of work for a lot of years. Uh, and so I look forward to finding some time to take a little bit of a break, but also the science. I, you know, I described for you the, the analysis phase, and that's actually really exciting. You know, as a scientist, you, you go into the field is really fun and exciting, but actually getting the data and diving into it. Wow. You know, what do we find in there? Right. That that's an exciting part of the process. And I really look forward to that. And then, of course, you know, as scientists, we're always thinking about how, what do we do next? Where do we go next? And so, of course, there are people that are talking about the next expedition to the Arctic and how could we do this better? And how could we, you know, examine some things that we learned during Mosaic that we know are interesting and, and maybe we could improve on, you know, how we approach that? Or, um, hey, this Arctic system continues to evolve. How can we do a better job of making our measurements there and not being as affected by the dynamics that we experienced during Mosaic or many other things, right? So. Yeah, so we already have our, you know, wheels spinning about, hey, what's the next big project in the Arctic? Uh, speaking of uh, next project, if you were to, uh, for example, if you were to yourself lead or if someone else were to lead another experiment or another expedition to the Arctic and they were to sort of continue from where you guys left off, what would you say to the people running that experiment? What would you say that they should be doing? Yeah, that's a, a loaded question. That is a loaded question for sure. Um, you know, we've got a lot of specific knowledge that we've learned from Mosaic and, and kind of specific details of, hey, you should do this, you shouldn't do that, or, you know, this is more effective than that. So there's a lot of those kind of things. But for me, one of the most important things about this kind of an endeavor is the collaborative environment. Right? You have to put a lot of effort and resources into ensuring and fostering collaboration. And that's from the leadership, that's from the scientists, that's from the people going to the field, that's from the people back home. It has to be collaborative across the board. Um, because these days to, to, to pull off something big like this requires many nations. I believe it requires different disciplines in science. And so we have to be able to work very well together across those boundaries so that we're all on the same team, so that we're all uh, kind of supporting the same mission. And so to me, that's the important thing is lay a foundation that fosters strong collaboration uh, and strong cooperation. Yeah. And you guys, uh, your team has obviously shown this. You've spent like 12 years before the experiment, just finishing all of this research, all this preparation with each other. And I think that's just so amazing that you guys put all this time into this project and it ended up being such a huge success. Like this was the, the largest Arctic expedition, I think, in history. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Shoup, uh, for appearing on our podcast. Uh, congratulations on the success of Mosaic. And thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was uh, great to chat with you.